Gosh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here and do this. I'm a little bit nervous because the room's full of people I know, which hasn't been the case in the past. Um, so, yeah, this is not an easy topic, but let's see what we can do. Post-traumatic stress disorder always follows a traumatic event, and a traumatic event is one where somebody either experiences or witnesses actual or threatened death or harm. There are four sets of symptoms that people um, need to have for us to call it PTSD, and these need to exist for at least a month. So, you know, after birth, you can, people can be a bit traumatised, a bit, you know, anxious, things. If it settles within a month, they don't have PTSD. They might have had some stress, but it's settled. So 45% of women can find childbirth traumatic. That's a large number of women. But in terms of those who develop full post-traumatic stress disorder meeting all the criteria, we have on average around 4%. That's the instance, that's the prevalence rather, that's been um, identified earlier this year in a big meta-study. If we look just at those who've had maybe a stillbirth, or a premature birth or baby who's very, very sick, um, then that can go up to 18.5% of those women. So I wanted to look at this a little bit more. If we look at postnatal depression, we've got 10 to 15% of women might develop postnatal depression. 0.1% might develop postpartum psychosis. So if you look at where PTSD sits within that, this is an important area that we need to spend more time looking at. And it's only recently really begun to be researched. There is an overlap between PTSD and postnatal depression, but they are two different disorders. They have different diagnoses, different assessments, and different treatment. And I recently helped co-author a paper by a student here at Edinburgh looking at just defining those differences so that's available to, to look at, particularly to help midwives identify that. So in terms of what causes PTSD, we know that obstetric complications, you know, major um, interventions or problems cause, uh, are predictive of PTSD. Neonatal complications are three times more likely to predict PTSD but interpersonal factors are four times more likely. And this drew my attention when I discovered this. Interpersonal, that's really actually consistent with general PTSD. In general, women are more likely to develop PTSD than men, twice as likely. And for women, it's more likely to follow an event which was an interpersonal event, such as you know, um, rape or domestic violence, whereas for men, it might follow more objective, like a car accident or war. So this interpersonal factor is very consistent. And within those interpersonal factors, in fact, one of the highest ones in that particular study was being ignored. It's the quality of the interaction with their care provider, how the woman perceives that. Now that is, as midwives, that's challenging, sorry. Um, but it's also potentially an area we can work with. But just before we go down this path, just want to remind you that the vast majority of women do not develop any post-traumatic stress symptoms. Women most often find their midwives to be really affirming and positive and that that interaction is a really good one. So on the whole, we as midwives do a brilliant job. But there's a very small and significant number of women who do develop full PTSD and I wanted to look at this and see what can we address here for ourselves. So quality provider interaction. The clue is in the word interaction. There are two people, there's a woman and a midwife. And up till now, most of the research has looked at what the women tell us, what their experience is. But there is no research that actually goes to midwives and say, what is your experience when you're with women? How does it feel for you? So I'm very definitely, contrary to some public media, which I'll talk about later, looking at both sides of this story. So I've interviewed six women. These women all have post-traumatic stress disorder post-childbirth, and they're between nine months and four years since they had their babies. And I've interviewed six midwives. All are interpartum midwives with significant experience. I chose interpartum midwives because the women tell me that the time at which the trauma event exists for them is either during birth or early postnatal period. I'm using IPA, which is a really long-winded 
and time-consuming form of analysis, as I'm discovering now, but it really goes in depth to that lived experience, to what really was happening for those individuals. And there's interpretation in that, because I am a mother and a midwife, so obviously I have my own personal stuff, so that's all being woven into reflection within that. And my question to the woman, I was saying, please tell me about your experience of being cared for by midwives. And for the midwives, I'm saying, please tell me about your experience of being with women. Not about being a midwife, per se, or your job, but what is it for you when you're with women? I want to see how they felt and what it meant for them. So this is a very particular focus. So far, I've completed the analysis for three women and three midwives, and the others are still ongoing. And what I'd like to do now is tell you, first, what the midwives had to say because we've, we have heard from women. I will tell you what the women say, but I'd like to tell you what the midwives say first. So midwives really want to be supported to do their job, and they want the opportunity to be with women. In IPA, we develop lots of themes. It's far too busy. I don't expect you to read that slide, but what I want you to notice is that all the midwives spoke at some way about communication <laughs> and about the need for women to do their part in this relationship. So a lot of women don't tell you things, though. A lot of women don't tell you things until labour the next time, so they keep a lot of things hidden. It often helps when you get feedback from women to say, oh, you explained that really well. Or, you know, thank you for giving me that time. But what can change it is the charge midwife rushing you and you won't be given that time to spend with the woman. Sometimes it's really, you know, the most natural thing in the world to talk to people. At other times, it's a bit like drawing teeth. I do quite like them to have, you know, not necessarily a birth plan, but I like them to have given a little bit of thought to kind of what they want. Midwives talk about not having choice, not having control always, and being responsible for safety. I have a responsibility for ensuring safety as well. If there's certain policies and procedures, then you have the ethical dilemma with the woman. We do kind of live in the real world. When you weigh up choice and safety, then you know safety can become paramount. She had meconium. She had all these D cells, but she didn't want any interference. So that was a very difficult scenario because I think she felt we were trying to introduce things she didn't want at all. But if you saw the trace, well, we were all very anxious before the baby came. Perhaps not your immediate colleagues, management, basically, because they're the people that are forcing you to be in this situation. They're the people that are forcing the unsafe environment. They talk about work pressure and demands and how that impacts on their way of being with women. I don't think I listen to women as well because I've got too much on my mind. I'm thinking ahead, you know, like I'll come in here, listen to the FH, do this, do that, go through there, do the antibiotics, I'll do that, then I'll do that, so that's fine. And then the women will start speaking and you know, I haven't got time for this. If they've got somebody that's really unwell in there, then a lot of your care will go to that woman. And the other women will not be neglected, but you won't be able to give them as much care as you'd like to. And I've always got in the back of the mind, I'm always thinking, I should be telling them more. But you're not always able to, because you're so busy doing things. But you literally just feel as if all you're doing, you're just going from one room to the other, doing the things that need to be done, ticking the boxes, signing the boxes need to be signed, and that's all you can really do. You can't develop relationships with these women at all. Midwives then talk about the colleagues and support. When we're short-staffed, you can be looking after a woman who's got a loss, and then a woman in early labour, which is very difficult to go between the two. You know, chop and change your emotions. This woman, this midwife, felt she was being treated a bit like a robot. That's another problem. You don't always get your breaks. You don't get time to get your head kind of back in and sorted. I've learned to probably not go to colleagues now, because it's not very helpful and bounce from one room once the placenta is out, you know, you're shoved into another, you feel you've completely abandoned that woman. I got to the stage where I feel the place runs on stress, and as a result, there's a lot of bickering, and there's more bickering than there is support. There's a huge bullying culture within the staff there, and they do feel undermined. So midwives are expressing a lot of negative emotion. You want to be supportive to the women as possible, but in the back of your mind, you're always thinking of other things, bad things you've seen that impacts on what we take forward. You deliver someone and then you're quickly taken out of that room, put in to look after someone else. I find that frustrating. That's the one I find the worst because I feel like you should have that time with your woman afterwards. This early postnatal separation, as it were, has been highlighted by all the midwives I spoke to and all the women. 
If I pick up negative vibes, I think, God, what have I done or what have I not done? I was fighting against a system where, you know, it was like bang your head against a wall. I got completely frustrated and I thought, I don't think I can do this anymore. There's a huge culture of very negative things. I've tried to be proactive, tried to change, but I've been met with a lot of undermining behaviour and that's quite frustrating. Things were very badly managed. She was very badly treated. It's so frustrating. I was so angry. So we come to the women now. Women do describe, you're going to hear, some very negative perceptions of QPI, but all of the women I spoke to also really could see when it was really positive. So these are not women who just, just think everybody's negative. These were women who could really knew when it was right and when it was positive, but had contrasting negative experience that was very significant. So again, women talk about choice and control. Once I stepped into the hospital, it felt like authority was taken away from me and other people told me what was best for me and my baby and there was little dialogue. As soon as they said I needed to get induced, that's when I stopped feeling like I was in control with any of the decisions. It's the way they were explaining things that made me feel I didn't have much of a choice. I was trying to push the mask off. This is a mask in theatre for oxygen. It's, I can feel it. But obviously because of pushing it off before, the woman was like, no, 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 you need it, and rammed it. She was really pushing it onto my face. I was waving and slapping hands. I was, so I started to panic and be very frightened. Women talk about feeling unsafe and lack of trust. I felt almost threatened that if I didn't manage to give birth, I was going to have a C-section. It felt more threatening than helpful and caring, almost like lying under a guillotine. It was really, it felt like this, this threat, this constant threat on the horizon. I just had this idea that maybe when I arrived, there'd be this motherly presence to go, OK, we've got you. They just stood there staring at me, blankly, hands on hips, and one kind of sighed and went, oh, oh why are you in a wheelchair? Tutting and sighing. I felt like I was a nuisance. I'd caused a problem they had to sort out, and they were like, they didn't greet me at all. They didn't reassure me in any way. She said she thinks the baby's back to back, that they were feeling the wrong thing. I was actually only one centimetre, probably never four, and was, well, they were getting confused because they didn't realise the position of the baby. This midwife was really, woman rather, really beginning to lose confidence in the ability of her midwives. They talk about lack of connection and lack of support. I felt like they were strangers. I'd gone into labour in the supermarket queue and it was the checkout women. They probably would have been warmer, to be honest. They were just cold. I didn't want to interact with them. Ushered into a room and it was all about paperwork and I was sitting on a bed, kind of puffing and panting and the woman was totally focused on her paperwork and her forms and her files. I was completely alone with a new human being that I didn't really know how to care for when I was physically restricted. Oh yeah, I felt really alone and tired and drugged up. She just kind of did her own thing. She didn't really check on me very much. She didn't talk to me. She didn't seem to engage with me very much. She was just sitting in a corner typing. Lack of respect, lack of communication. I just have to move. And it was again, oh God, sorry, you just need to lie down, that kind of thing. Right, just lie down. Just, it won't take long. Oh God, you know, just totally, I need to do this and you need to comply. She was the main issue. She just held out a tablet in the pot, like, here, take this, some sort of, <laughs> no, this is such and such, it's to do whatever. So I said, you know, what is it? She said, just, just tutting, everyone has it. I'd have to buzz someone every time I needed to feed him or change him. So I buzzed after three hours and asked for the baby to feed him. And they said, oh, you never wake a sleeping baby. And they actually walked away. And I had to wait 20 minutes to build up the courage to buzz again and say, no, I actually want to feed my baby now. Absolutely helpless, absolutely powerless, as if I didn't matter. Just there was no communication. That was the worst thing about the entire experience, is that there frequently seemed to be hours or half of days on end with absolutely no communication. That was in the early postnatal period. So that's a lot of words. I've got a small summary here. Women are looking for support. They want respect, but midwives want to be respected as well. And they want, both want connection. And then women midwives are telling us about the support and the respect they want from colleagues and from the system to be enabled to really do their job. 
Now what I've done, and I don't, if I don't, I won't press this because I'm not sure what's going to happen next. I actually took this because that's a lot of words. Do you know that's, how, what do you do with that? And I've made a short film. And I have a background in expressive dance. And I went to a couple of my friends and said, do you know, can we do something with this? So we now have a three minute film that hopefully puts some of that into a different expression just to, to look at. We've heard a lot about these reviews and hopefully a change in the way that we're able to be with women will be a step forward. Um, when I presented this to the Royal College of Midwives about a month ago, the Daily Mail got excited. Um, oh sorry, before I tell you about the Daily Mail, I'll tell you about the sanctuary trauma. is a term likely to occur when a woman turns from others from whom she expects comfort during or after a traumatic experience and is treated with harshness or indifference. And at first when I came across this, I thought of the women. But actually as I'm reading the midwife stories, I'm thinking of the midwives as well. So yeah, when I went to the, the Royal College of Midwives, the Daily Mail were there. I didn't know that, they didn't come and tell me, but two days later they emblazoned it all across Daily Mail online that heartless midwives were giving new mothers post-traumatic stress, failing to mention the research that I'm doing looking at the midwives. Um, so yeah, just to say I am doing that, equally if not more importantly looking at the midwives because we don't know what they say. And then it followed up with a couple of, I even made the sun. So thank you very much. <laughs>